All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Anna Mabel Jones, and I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is I haven't picked up a drink or any mind-alterating drugs since August the 30th, 1999. Yeah, and because of that, I'm honored to be here today as the moderator for the panel on recovery housing research, why it matters, and why we participate, right? So I'm gonna get a few um, housekeeping things in order for us. All right, so the first one is, um, welcome to the Oxford House World Convention. Woo! Yeah. Lanyards and name badges are required to enter all sessions. We're gonna ask you to silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. And we're gonna ask no side conversations during the panel. Step outside if needed. Please don't smoke or vape near entries. And of course, don't smoke or vape in your rooms, right? Um, dispose of cigarette butts properly and safely, no littering. Take notes during the session to relay back to your chapter. And questions will be addressed at the end of the session. So we're gonna to try to you know, have at least 10 or 15 minutes um, at the end of the session so these awesome speakers can you know, get, some, get your answers answered, okay? And let me just talk a little bit about what this panel is about. So we're honored to have um, Oxford House has been at the forefront of encouraging Oxford House residents to participate in behavioral research and data collection, right? We know that, get that every year. Um, this encompasses both in-house research conducted by Oxford House and independent third-party academic research conducted by researchers such as those associated with DePaul program. Recovery research has been hampered by the historical focus of anonymity by 12-step groups. While anonymity has its purpose, it has also had the effect of eliminating research on recovery and determining more definitely that works and what doesn't. This panel will discuss why behavioral research particularly that relates to addiction and recovery is essential and why Oxford House residents should participate in such research. They will identify concrete co conclusions that will have been reached due to addiction recovery research, the implications of such findings and what needs to be done. The audience will have the opportunity to ask questions. So I'm gonna introduce our first panelist. And our first panelist, I love her. She's such an advocate when it comes to recovery. Her name is Gina Sheldon. Gina Sheldon is an expert in peer recovery support and recovery oriented systems of care. Areas of focus include recovery, community organizations, recovery housing, workforce development, harm reduction, and medications for opioid use disorder. Gina has consulted for Opioid Response Network since 2018 co-author of the Texas 46-Hour Recovery Support Peer Specialist Curriculum, as well as the Recovery Coaching, a harm reduction pathway training, and designed the first Medicaid, medication assistant recovery supportive infrastructure for her state. She is currently the lead opioid response trainer at the Addiction Research Institute at the University of Texas at Austin, and works with a verbal training team to implement recovery communities within the opioid treatment provider space. Let's welcome Jenna. Y'all, that's a long bio and I actually shortened it for this. <laughs> it's really hard to talk about all the things you love doing. Um, so yes, my name's Jenna Sheldon. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is um, I have been liberated from my alcohol use disorder and problematic drug use since June 29th, 2012. And I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. I see y'all got the cash app payments that I sent out last night. Um, I am here from the great state of Texas. And um, in addition to all the um, 
the bullet points that I gave Anna, I did, I worked for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission for a while. I actually had the Oxford House contract as well as recovery housing development in the state of Texas, and then moved into the opioid response team once we got that grant. And so I, my loves are many, and research is one of them. Typically when I come to the convention, I talk about medication assisted treatment and medications for opioid use disorder. This is, I think, my first time to be on a, a research panel, so I'm really excited. And I feel like, so I'm a geek when it comes to research and policy, which basically means lawmaking, and how the policy and lawmaking affects us, um, all the way down to the field level, just regular old people in recovery. Um, so I'm a little geeky about it. And I feel like if y'all are in here, you may just have a smidge of geek in you also, um, which is good. It's a good thing, but it's not just for geeks anymore. I mean, really data is, it's just information, right? And when we talk about data scientifically, we're talking about how to tie it together in a way that's meaningful. Um, and so, uh, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about um, how that looks today. I'll be speaking just at a more broad level because Amy um, Miracle, who I finally got to meet in person today after uh, years of random calls uh, since probably around 2015, she's going to get into some meat and potatoes on some really exciting work that's being done. But so problematic substance use has been around for a long, long time. It didn't just come with our generation or our parents' generation. Um, attempts to really understand how substance use uh, disorder affects us has been in existence since, since we got to this land. Um, and I say we, meaning I am from a European descent um, and a, a tiny, tiniest little bit of indigenous, but not enough to, to claim it. Um, so. Dr. Benjamin Rush was one of the uh, signers of uh, our foundational documents, and he was one of the first ones to actually begin um, doing research on how substance use affects um, individuals. He was a pioneer. But the thing is, he didn't obviously have any of the scientific tools and resources needed at the time to actually measure and, and replicate um, some of the things he was uh, theorizing. And if you follow science, you know you have to be able to replicate with validity, um, be able to demonstrate the same effects over and over again for outcomes to be considered as scientifically proven. Although you, you, you know now being on social media for as long as we have that people say things are um, studies show they use that term very loosely, very regularly. If you were in Dr. Gitlow's presentation yesterday, you know a little bit about what he's talking about. Um, so it's always important to look at the source of what studies you're looking at. Is it in a, uh, is it in a journal? Is it a peer-reviewed journal? Um, has it been commonly accepted by the scientific community before sharing that information? And that's why, as Anna said in her intro, Oxford House has been so vital to the scientific body of work around recovery and specifically recovery housing. Um, so we know that it's um, possible um, to be able to now prove out some of the things that theorists such as uh, Dr. Rush were um, hypothesizing as far back as the late 1700s. Oops, I have a trigger finger, y'all. I may have over-caffeinated to offset my jet lag. <laughs> and if you saw me yesterday and I looked super gacked out, it's because I was hy hyper-caffeinated from the jet lag. Um, so... So we want to talk a little bit about science over lore. I like the word lore. I have some D&D gamers at home. Um, I don't, yeah. <laughs> um, I get a little, I start to zone out a little when they start talking to me about the lore. Um, but really when we're saying lore, we're talking about like things that we've heard that may be taken as a, a common assumption, but isn't necessarily been proven um, as borne out. And so I really love, in addition to um, the, the policy research that Amy's group does and the research that um, DePaul does, I really love the Recovery Research Institute um, out of Harvard um, Medical School. They have a lot, done a lot of work on um, just recovery research in general. Um, and so when they talk about um, what our research uh, can show is that what we already know, we, we can engage in community in a way that gives back and, and is of service um, with stability and long-term quality of life outcomes but we just haven't had anybody come behind us uh, with great vigor and really prove 
that out until over the last couple of decades, um, and it's growing even more. Luckily, because of the opioid response funding um, that has been poured into a lot of the programs, we're now getting more money for like really large scale research designs um, to prove what we already know to be true. And that's really exciting. We get to talk a little bit about why you should be part of that um, today. One of the biggest issues is because um, when we are talking about disorders and diseases, we typically only see the behaviors. Um, and again, I'm gonna refer to uh, Dr. Gitlow's presentation yesterday. Oftentimes the public, they don't understand the um, physiology behind it, uh, the biology and the psychology. And it is really just this constellation of interacting variables that it varies from person to person independently with just such um, fascinating interactions. And so people tend to see the outcomes and, and not the causes. And so what research does is it allows us to take a much uh, more detailed look at some of the causes. It tends to help us destigmatize substance use um, and substance use disorder. And I say those things separately because I want to acknowledge that there are people who use substances recreationally that don't um, move into the disorder category or the most severe of that would, would be addiction. And so we have to acknowledge that there are people out there who can use safely. It's about 10% of us who <laughs> just forget it. <laughs> and I'm one of them. Um, and so one of the things that um, research shows us is um, how to move forward um, with the factors that I have here. And I apologize, y'all. I'm very uh, nearsighted, so it's hard for me to see my own uh, bullets um, on the um, screen in front of me. And COVID actually uh, took away some of the poor eyesight that I already had. So I'm even blinder now than I was before I got COVID. Uh, but we can see that problematic substance use, and particularly with addiction and that associated model, um, we can teach people how to really understand that and to think more critically about some of the behaviors that they're seeing if we can talk about the underlying physiological, psychological, and biological um, patterns that make us more susceptible to addiction. So for instance, with opioid use disorder, we now know so much more about how certain medications and certain substances interact with the um, mu opioid receptor, and that's just one of a handful of opioid receptors. And what's interesting is the gentleman who um, really helped um, codify the use of methadone, Dr. Dole, um, he theorized that like way back in the 60s. But again, as with uh, Dr. Rush, he didn't have a way to, to bear that out scientifically. He could just say, this is what I think is going on. Interestingly, in the late 80s, he got a Lasker Award, which is a Nobel Award for hypothesizing the opiate ligand receptor system, and then science later came behind him and proved it. Um, so these hypotheses are important, but um, even more important is the body of work we do um, to, to demonstrate that the hypotheses are in fact uh, legitimate uh, ways to identify um, research. So it is essential, um, and just by the way, if y'all haven't been to one of my MAT-related um, sessions, I just want y'all to know, because I know that there's still some hesitation around the use of methadone and buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, um, in some of our recovery houses, but um, AA and Dr. Dole actually have been intertwined for a long time. Dr. Dole was actually a non-alcoholic trustee on uh, one of the governing AA boards, and he worked closely with Bill uh, because Bill thought maybe Dr. Dole would have a cure for alcoholism. Rumors are that um, Dr. Dole may have had a bit of a drinking problem. So there was a symbiotic relationship there. Uh, but recovery research is um, very essential um, because uh, it's undervalued in the U.S. Um, there, y'all, there are other countries who are uh, way ahead of us as far as um, drug research and drug policy is concerned. Um, so we, as individuals in recovery, we've really got to get it together and start participating in um, the research available so that we can we can get up to speed with these other countries. Um, the funding opportunities and grants for research on recovery housing um, are still difficult to secure, even though we're starting to get more of it. There's still not enough of it. Um, and typically government funding doesn't allow for sufficient follow-up as far as recovery studies are concerned. They need to be longitudinally based. So that means they need to go on and on and on and on for several years to be able to replicate the validity. Um, and so sometimes we don't get a lot of funding to do that part. Uh, we get like initial pilot funding, but we don't necessarily get the long-term funding that um, upholds the work that we do. So it only 
typically allows for uh, two years of research. Um, but the research on recovery support requires like 10 years. Uh, five to 10 years is great. 10 years or more is even better. And that's, again, that's difficult. Um, we see a lack of standardization. There's a lack of regulation and oversight um, as far as the systems um, that we want to do research in. And so that tends to uh, create some barriers for getting the money. Because research isn't free. You have to pay people. <laughs> you, it costs money. Um, people aren't just out here working for free to the degree that needs to happen to codify some of the research. Um, we have bifurcated systems. So what that means is we have lots of different silos that the money flows through from the top. And that creates challenges as well because you have people who um, maybe they don't know these Folks over here also have money. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of territorialism that unfortunately is a part of working in academia. Um, everybody's kind of in competition for some of the same money. So we're even in even at University of Texas, we have groups that are secretive sometimes about some of the research they're doing because they want to hold on to the money that their department gets. And that's often a big part of um, of them being considered successful, unfortunately, um, is being able to bring in a certain amount of money. But don't tell anybody I told you all that. That's top secret. Um, so also subject matter proficiency. Um, so finding the, the appropriate homes, which Amy is gonna talk about um, in her presentation, um, find, and accessing the homes. So knowing that they're out there, connecting with them, building a rapport with them, um, and being able to extract the data or mine the data from the homes, that part has been a big hindrance previously um, for the research we do in recovery housing. And I say we, because I got to do a little bit with Dave's group in Oklahoma and um, Kentucky in 2019, and it is, it's like finding a needle in a haystack sometimes um, to be able to pull out all of the recovery houses. Y'all know you've been in Oxford House. How many of you have been in other recovery houses? Just by a show of hands, if you feel comfortable sharing. Okay. So... Um, Typically, you find that through word of mouth, right? Through your own recovery community, possibly from your AA or your NA meeting. So typically, people have to be embedded in those recoveries to be able to find those houses to get access to them. Um, there are different types of recovery houses. There are recovery houses that are located with treatment centers. Um, there are recovery houses that are ma and pa operated. Um, and then there are recovery houses that um, there are, unfortunately, some uh, malfeasant. Um, we'll just say it, slumlords out there, um, not everywhere, but in some places there are people who are um, less than um, less than caring um, as compared to what they could be. Um, that is few and far between uh, in my experience. But the participation that we get to do is really, um, it's an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, benefits like if you participate in the research that Oxford House does, um, Feeling that sense of empowerment, um, the ability to um, increase your own knowledge, the ability to connect with other individuals who are experiencing the same um, phenomenological uh, processes that you're experiencing, um, and then also being able to care about the outcomes of the study. These are really great benefits of, of participating um, in the research yourself. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is it can be considered a fledgling area of service. Now, maybe not so much in Oxford because Oxford's been doing research for a long time. But what's cool is that y'all get to set the bar for everybody else because Oxford has been doing it for so long. Some of the things that recovery, we know recovery research um, has taught us, um, both in general and specifically, um, is that long-term recovery supports, um, they're, they're key to treating the chronic illness of addiction. We did a big research evaluation at um, Addiction Research Institute at UT Austin on our recovery support services in Texas. And so we gathered data starting in 2014 all the way through 2018. We had thousands of participants and just some really basic um, measures of success included like reduced emergency room visits, um, reduced um, illness, um, more wage earning related to the types of jobs people were able to move into once they stabilized in their recovery. We know that just from that initial four years of, of survey data um, that we did in REDCap, um, 
in Texas um, indicates that we saved our taxpayers about $3.4 million a year just in the recovery support services in the state of Texas. And at the time, there are only 22 providers in our state of 27 million uh, people. Um, if you aren't, haven't been to Texas, y'all, just know it's, it's not just big. It has a lot of people in it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> some of the things that we've learned, and um, if you've ever been with me in any training, I'll talk heavily about stigmatizing language. That one has uh, been well covered, not only by Recovery Research Institute, but by a few other uh, recovery research across the field. Um, as far as the language we use, self-identifying in the rooms, if I say I'm Jenna, I'm alcoholic, then I tend to increase my bonding with um, Anna. Um, but when I'm out in public and there's nobody in the room that I know of that is a friend of Bill, um, I would say my name's Jenna, I'm a person in re full remission from alcohol use disorder. Um, and then that provides uh, less stigmatizing um, identification. Um, and if you follow Faces and Voices of Recovery, you know that there's a whole spiel around the recovery messaging, which you've heard everybody do so far to, at this conference. Um, one of the things that recovery research has taught us is really how, what are some meaningful measures of recovery capital? Meaning what are the strengths and the skills and all of the good things that we bring into recovery with us? For so long, our research has been pathology oriented. What's wrong with you? Deficits based. Why can't you just quit? Just put the plug in the jug. Why can't you do that? And it's crazy to me that a, a whole field of study that um, largely references uh, our problematic substance use as a disease still attributes volition uh, and willingness and choice, um, even though they're saying it's a disease. And nobody I know chooses to get diabetes, cancer, or heart disease. So, I mean, it just follows from that. Um, research has also taught us about cost savings for the community, which I just mentioned. Um, and then specifically, as we talk about uh, recovery research for recovery housing, it's starting to teach us which types of housing characteristics might uh, be more beneficial uh, for different populations. We know that one size fits all doesn't necessarily, it, it just doesn't work. Um, for instance, Kathleen and I have had lots of conversations about sometimes Oxford House isn't the first stop for some folks because they need higher levels of support um, and getting a little bit more practice with their self-sufficiency skills um, before they move into the, the completely autonomous um, realm of an Oxford House. So knowing where somebody fits um, and being able to determine how a recovery house can um, uh, respond to those needs is really important. And then also how people from different cultures are impacted. That part is really important. We're starting to do more um, research on that. Um, different subpopulations, for instance, transgender individuals, we know that that sometimes um, is um, something that might be difficult for recovery houses to wrap their minds around. And then as the, the person who is um, gender diverse moving into it, it's very can be very fear evoking for them because they may not feel safe because they just don't know. Um, and there was actually some uh, DePaul research around the transgender experience in Oxford House. So knowing that um, we, we definitely just need to understand different ways we can address people's needs. Um, more information about how uh, recovery research has helped us move forward um, with the scientific body of, of work. You can see that are all these really great um, outcomes related to recovery research. Um, we need more information about um, how to uh, prepare houses for medications for opioid use disorder. We understand that there are different levels of readiness and capacity, and I will say even willingness um, it, across the broad community of the different types of recovery housing that's available. Um, transition aged or opportunity youth, there are so many disengaged, disconnected youth um, between the late teens through maybe age 25 that are out there um, on the streets because they need different levels of support um, that we, we just haven't learned how to really identify and implement um, for appropriate uh, levels of care for them. COPSID, which is basically co-occurring um, uh, disorders, so mental health, right? It's not chicken egg. Uh, I don't know why we even had that conversation. They, 
it's, it's, a, it's an omelet sometimes by the time we um, get to helping individuals out. And then family housing. We know in our Oxford houses, for instance, that we open men's houses first, uh, stabilize them, and then bring in the women's houses. And then, then we move into um, parents with children. But we know that women's houses are harder to stabilize. That's not just Oxford House. That's, that's just pretty ubiquitous or universal across the recovery housing community. And it's because women have just a lot more... Uh, gender role expectations ascribed to them typically. Um, and even when it's not ascribed, they might assume it based on you know historical conditioning. Um, so family housing is really important. And I don't just mean women and children and men and children. I mean whole, whole entire families being able to live together in a recovery-oriented um, and structured environment. I'm keeping track of my time. Um, <laughs> um, so. What more information do we need? Again, gender um, specific um, research. So not just houses for men or houses for women, but houses for uh, non-binary and transgender individuals. Some people are gonna be more comfortable um, in a hetero, you know, heteronormative environment. Some people are gonna be more comfortable in just one type of gender. Some people may be more comfortable in a non-binary population. And so understanding and being able to assess in a uniform way how uh, people are gonna be able to fit into a recovery house um, in a way that works for them. A uniform assessment is already done in the other realms of housing. Um, and I think that it would be important for us to figure something out. I don't know about any research, I'm sure these folks over here do, um, about ways to assess um, uh, our incoming candidates for housing. Obviously not at Oxford House, y'all already have your own ways of doing that and that's settled by each house. Uh, harm reduction housing. So a lot of people assume that housing first is harm reduction housing, and to some degrees it is, but there's also a lot of rules that pre they preclude folks in our subpopulations from entering um, housing first. Lots of rules around like manufacturing and distributing methamphetamines. <laughs> um, so there's lots of rules. Uh, being able to have respite housing, like what we see in Florida, uh, there is one model that has a respite house. We need a lot more of that because when you um, have to leave an Oxford house and you have 15 minutes to go, um, if you don't have somewhere safe to go, what are the likelihood that you're going to go back into some environments that you were trying to recover from? You know, so having a place that's sort of a, a safe place to land in between is important. And then addressing housing rights, which we know Oxford House has been doing for a really, really long time. We need a lot more research around policy implications um, for that. Legal Action Center has some really cool information. Just Google Legal Action Center um, if you want to know more about some of those uh, rights. What's on the horizon? So in Texas, Project Homes has been doing like a, um, and that's at a different UT group, um, UT Health Science Center in Houston. They're doing a controlled study on um, medications for opioid use disorder in recovery houses with recovery coaches and without recovery coaches. Um, and with them, we are now um, talking about doing some uh, transgender related studies um, in Project Homes as well. Stay tuned for that. I would tell you more, but I literally just don't have the information to give you yet because we're in our preliminary discussions. Casamia in San Antonio is a family-based recovery housing um, type of uh, uh, resource uh, for mommies. And then Be Well Texas is out of UT San Antonio as well. Uh, yeah, the state funnels a lot of money through universities because it's just easier to contract, uh, but also we get good evaluation components out of it. Be Well Texas is about to um, launch a whole bunch of recovery housing in the state of Texas specifically for MAT. Um, and I know a lot of our Texas outreach are working closely with uh, those providers who are getting that money because we need to all be collaborating. Um, and our, our outreach at Oxford has always been really good about collaborating and not competing. Um, SGM, that's sexual gender minority. I hate that term. I think it's really reductive, but unfortunately it is still the academic um, terminology, meaning LGBTQIA plus <laughs> communities. So that's what we know we have more of on the horizon. And it's really exciting um, to get to see how this is all going to come together. I really appreciate y'all's um, time. Um, as always, you can reach out to me. My address is up here. Um, if you have any further questions beyond what we get to cover today at our Q&A. And with that, I'm going to yield uh, my, the rest of the time to Amy and Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna. Hey, let's give Jenna another round of applause. That was awesome. Yeah.
Okay, and I love the part when you talked about um, MAT, because we do MAR, Medicaid Assistant Recovery. Um, and I know Paul's a st stickler for that, so I just wanted to say I tapped him and I was like, MAR, right? Um, but I love the part when you talked about stigmatizing and how important it is for us to do research on that, because who better? Nothing for us without us. That's my thing. So if we're not the ones giving the research or you know, being able to talk about ourselves, then we have people talking about us who know nothing about us. So that is so important, you know, and she talked about recovery capital. If you all don't know what recovery capital is, you need to Google it, right? Because that's who we are, you know, it touches the inside and the outside of us. And research needs to be done about that too. So thank you, Jennifer, for um, bringing in those. That was pretty awesome. So we're going to get to our next speaker. And this is Dr. Miracle. Dr. Miracle is a addiction health services researcher with expertise in recovery support services. She received, um, she received graduate degrees from the University of Michigan and the University of Chicago and completed postdoctoral training at the University of Chicago, San Francisco. As a researcher, as a research scientist in the alcohol research group at the Public Health Institute, her work focuses on identifying unmet needs for treatment and recovery support services, as well as examining innovative approaches to meet these needs. Let's welcome Dr. Merkel. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm Amy Miracle, and um, I'm so pleased to be at this conference, and I'm so grateful to see so many people at this session. There are so many amazing breakout sessions. I'm just glad that you guys wanted to join us and watch lots of people, nerdy people with glasses on, talk about research, so thank you. Um, I'm really excited to um, be talking about um, the topic of um, research. It's one of my favorite topics. And um, we have a really great panel. Um, Jenna's presentation was amazing, and we're going to hear from Paul Stevens later. Um, what do I want to accomplish with this presentation? Um, well, really, um, we probably only have time for just a few things. Um, first, I want to spend a little time reviewing recovery and why recovery housing is so critical to recovery. Um, next, I want to talk about the evidence base for recovery housing and gaps in our knowledge about recovery housing. Um, and finally, I want to spend a little time talking about the national study on treatment and addiction recovery residences, um, what I call the NSTAR project, um, and how um, this study fills gaps in knowledge and highlights the importance of recovery housing. So what do I mean um, when I say recovery? Or what do you mean when you say recovery? Uh, well, this seems like a really silly question, um, but recovery is something that the field has been trying to define for a number of years. Um, and I'm glad that um, Dr. Clark talked a little bit about this in his breakout session yesterday. Um, so the first formal definition that I recall seeing as a researcher appeared in the mid-2000s. And this was introduced by a consensus panel conven convened by Betty Ford. Um, the panel defined recovery as a voluntary lifestyle comprised of sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. Most recently, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism came out with a definition that defines recovery as a process through which an individual, oh, excuse me, um, I'm skipping a, a little bit. Um, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism came it, um, out with a definition about um, it being remission from alcohol use disorder and cessation from drinking, from heavy drinking. Um, now, the National Institute on Drug Abuse also has a definition, and it borrows from SAMHSA's definition of recovery. Um, and SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and it defines recovery as a process through, of change through which people improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. Um, now, as I'm reading this, these definitions, you may um, hear some commonalities across them. Um, they all speak to recovery as a process and highlight outcomes that speak to well-being. Um, in fact, my favorite definition is the one put forth by SAMHSA um, because it not only underscores these components but also outlines key dimensions that support recovery. 
Um, the four dimensions outlined by SAMHSA are health, purpose, community, and home. Now, why would home be important? Well, in recovery, folks are learning and practicing new skills that promote health and wellness. Um, home should be a place where they get the social and emotional support to do this. Um, now, some folks may already have this sort of home environment um, when they initiate their recovery. Um, but for folks who don't, um, recovery housing can provide it. So what is recovery housing? Well, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this for this crowd. Um, but I always start here to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so both HUD, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and SAMHSA have come out with definitions of recovery housing. Um, HUD has defined it as um, housing in an abstinence-focused and peer-supported community for people recovering from substance use issues. SAMHSA has defined it, defined it as an intervention that is specifically designed to address the recovering person's need for a safe and healthy living environment while supplying the requisite recovery and peer supports. But because recovery housing can look like a lot of different things and go by a variety of different names, um, I always present the NAR levels. And so NAR is the National Alliance for Recovery Residences. Um, and these levels delineate four levels of care con uh, covering the entire spectrum of recovery housing from entirely peer-run residences, like Oxford House, um, to those that provide clinical services. And when I present the NAR levels, um, I also note that even though these levels highlight differences, there are also elements that unite um, these different types of residences and distinguish them from other service delivery mechanisms. For example, people live in recovery housing. It's not just a place where people receive peer support or services. It provides individuals a home. Moreover, individuals living in recovery housing provide one another recovery support and have responsibilities for maintaining the household environment as part of their recovery. So these are aspects of peer support and recovery um, that are key and critical to the social model of recovery. So why would research on recovery housing be important? I would say it's because research helps recovery housing get its foot in the door. Um, so although personal testimonials are incredibly helpful in opening hearts, data and research are equally helpful in changing people's minds. Research is useful in establishing credibility. Um, it can also facilitate advocacy for recovery housing and leveraging support for it. And finally, research is critical um, and critically important to recovery housing growth development and refinement so that we can serve more and serve better. The way I like to put it, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So what's the state of research on recovery housing? Is there an evidence base for it? Well, when I present on this, I'm always happy to report that there is indeed a strong and ever-growing evidence base for it. Um, for example, the evidence base for therapeutic communities, kind of the highest level of service in the continuum, um, and for Oxford houses at the other end, is quite robust. Um, so I don't know if you, you folks attended the session yesterday put on by the Oxford House to researchers at DePaul, um, but that's a wealth of knowledge. And Paul Stevens is going to be talking about even more research. Um, but like I said, again, quite robust. Um, there's also research on sober living houses in California. Um, and, um, you know, even though it's not as well researched as mutual help or interventions like 12 step, inter, uh, 12 step facilitation, it's uh, recovery housing research is one of the most, um, or recovery housing is one of the most researched recovery support services. Um, in fact, even at this stage, enough research has accumulated that SAMHSA has identified it as an evidence-based practice um, and listed it on its um, evidence-based practice resource center, as the slide up there shows. So unfortunately, despite this work, gaps in recovery housing research remain. Thank you, Jenna, for highlighting some of those. Um, so there's still a great deal to learn about um, how and for whom recovery housing works best, or what researchers like to call mechanisms and moderators of recovery housing. 
We're also missing research across the full spectrum of recovery housing. Um, so for example, we know a lot about Oxford houses. We know some about sober living houses in California. We know something about therapeutic communities. But if you're not one of those types of recovery residences, what does that research say about your program or your house? And finally, where there's still a lot of work to do, identifying the critical components of recovery housing, as well as just understanding what recovery residents look like across the country. Um, and more fundamentally, um, key questions about access and availability remain unanswered, such as how many recovery residences there may be and where they're located. So that's the evidence base, but what about support for recovery housing or what people know and how people feel about recovery housing? Or put another way, what's on people's minds and in people's hearts about recovery housing? So Oxford House has actually been quite masterful at garnering support at the federal level, um, as evidenced by the Federal Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988. So that was a while ago, that's, that's OG um, advocacy. <laughs> And that included a set aside um, at the state level for Oxford houses um, to set up startup loans. Um, and uh, Dr. Clark talked a little bit about that yesterday as well. Um, and for the longest time, that was really the only thing on the books or the only thing going at the federal level regarding recovery housing. But fortunately in the past decade, or the past couple years, um, we've come um, a really long way. There've been some pretty monumental shifts at the federal level pertaining to recovery housing. Um, and uh, recovery support and recovery support services more generally. Um, so this um, includes um, ONDCP listing um, the expansion of access to recovery support services and its priorities. Um, so ONDCP is the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, so the other thing that's pretty big is federal le legislation, the House and Senate to support recovery. So Dr. Clark talked about um, uh, the, the SAMHSA um, set-aside um, for recovery support services um, that's being discussed. Um, and most recently, SAMHSA launching its new Office of Recovery. Um, so while, while all these developments should be celebrated because I've been doing this for a while, it's been really hard fought, um, the struggle remains um, because suspicion about recovery housing remains. Um, and I may be a bit biased because I'm a researcher, um, but I would say that research can help allaying those concerns and suspicions. Um, and that's where I hope that the NSTAR projects come in. And no, you didn't hear me incorrectly. I did say projects, and that's with an S. Um, there are two of them. Um, the NSTAR Parent Project, um, which we usually just call the NSTAR Project, actually, so that's a little confusing. Um, and there's also the NSTAR COVID Supplement. Um, so the NSTAR Project has four aims, and I've listed the aims on this slide. Um, so for today's presentation, I'll primary, primarily focus on the first aim, which is to examine the availability of recovery houses and where recovery residences are located. Um, I'll also have some time to talk about aim two, um, which involves uh, conducting a national probability survey of all types of rec uh, recovery residences in all 50 states. Um, and we're, we're doing this to better understand what recovery housing looks like across the country, um, or what I like to think about as the possibility and promise of recovery housing to help people in recovery and the communities in which they're located. Um, and so the, the COVID supplement study, um, about a year after the NSTAR project was funded, we applied for and received an administrative supplement to the award. Um, and this is what we call our COVID supplement study. Um, and the COVID-specific su supplement has two aims, um, as you see listed on the slide. Um, it provides us with an opportunity to gather additional um, information about recovery residences across the country and how the pandemic has been affecting recovery housing. So how are we addressing the aims of those studies? Um, we're addressing the aims of the parent study by developing a national database of recovery residences um, to which we can link um, residences in the database to contextual factors. Um, and by contextual factors, um, basically community risk and resource information. Um, and from this database, um, we'll be drawing a stratified random sample of 800 residences representing each state in the country to survey residents' characteristics. 
with the data collected from the national survey, we'll be able to do some really neat things with respect to empirically deriving a typology of recovery residences to validate the NAR levels um, and examine associations with recovery housing evidence-based practices. So that's the parent study. Um, the COVID supplement project is smaller. Um, it's just two years and recruiting um, a smaller sample. We want to get 200, but we'll probably only have about 120. Um, but there are some neat elements to the study. Um, the sample of 120 residences will be followed over time. We'll do a baseline and a six month follow-up survey. Um, we'll collect some additional contextual data concerning health and health resources, and we'll collect qualitative data from residences that, are clo that have closed um, during the course of the study to get more information on factors that have contributed to their closure. What have we completed thus far on these studies? Um, well, with respect to the database, um, we finalized that in um, December of 2020. Um, it took, a, took us about a year to compile it, um, but we were able to collect information on 10,358 unduplicated residences across the country, representing over 3,628 different organizations. So what kind of information is in the database? Um, well, we wanted to collect as much locating and contact information as we could on each residence. Um, so locating information is address information, and contact information is information on um, the phone numbers, websites, and um, kind of persons in charge of the house. What have we done with this data? Um, well, we spent a great deal of time on geocoding activities to better understand the availability of recovery residences across the country and the characteristics of where they're located. Basically, the geocoding process has allowed us to link recovery residences through their addresses with information about their neighborhood, county, and state characteristics. Um, thus far, we've added data from the U.S. Census on neighborhood socioeconomic status and racial and ethnic composition, um, and linked residences to rural urban um, continuum codes at the county level. Um, we've also added information from the CDC on alcohol and drug-involved mortality um, as an indicator of need for recovery housing. And for the COVID supplement project, we've linked in um, the CD's COVID vulnerability index and subscales and collected data on publicly and privately funded hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and testing and vaccination site information. And finally, for a poster we presented at a conference this summer, we've also linked in um, information on um, federal, state, and local adult correctional facilities um, using some, some census data. Um, and these geocoding activities, I put some maps up here on this slide. Um, it, 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 it's very powerful. Um, so it's really probably hard to see, but the dots on these maps represent different residences across the country. Um, and we can overlay these, the map or where these dots are with different characteristics or information. Um, so the top um, map shows um, uh, whether a county is rural or urban, um, with the rural counties being represented by, by the green colors and the urban um, counties being represented by the yellow colors. Um, so you can see kind of how uh, where recovery residences lo uh, location relates to um, whether they're in rural or urban counties. Um, the bottom map um, does something similar. The blue dots again showed individual recovery residences, um, but the colors represent um, COVID vulnerability. Um, so the darker colors represent counties with greater COVID vulnerability, um, and the lighter co uh, colors um, showcase um, less COVID vulnerability. Um, so um, with, the beta, with the database information, we're also able to start recruitment and survey data collection. Um, for the NSTAR parent study, we're working our, our way across the country, state by state, randomly sampling residences to participate in our survey. Um, and random sampling just basically means that we're drawing names out of a hat. Um, and what does that survey do? The survey collects information on residents' characteristics, policies and practices, programming, um, organizational characteristics, um, program orientation, and basic information on who's completing the survey. And with respect to the survey, um, I have to give a, a big shout out to my colleague, Paul Stevens, um, who was relevant, uh, was absolutely incredibly helpful 
making sure that the information that we collected in our survey was relevant to Oxford houses, um, in addition to all the other different types of recovery residences. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, you know, we're working our way across the country. Um, we started in the Northeast this past January, um, and we're about a, a quarter of the way through, um, a quarter of the way to our goal. Um, and uh, we're in this process of recruiting for the survey, we're also updating and refining our database, um, changing addresses um, and contact information for residences that have moved or closed, um, and as well as adding new residences that may have opened since we first created, created the database. Um, for the COVID supplement study, we finished recruitment in April. Um, we collected baseline um, information on 121 residences across the country. Most of them were randomly sampled, but we also had folks um, who volunteered um, to complete a survey for the project. Um, we're now in the process of completing six-month follow-up surveys with the residences to see if anything had changed um, since we did their baseline survey. Um, and we have found that some residences have closed. Um, a total of only four of them, actually. Um, and we've completed some semi-structured interviews um, to get a better sense of the factors that have led or that may have led to the closure and whether that was related to COVID. So you may recall um, that this, um, the subtitle to this breakout session is Why Research Matters and Why Participate. Um, well, as a researcher, I can talk all day about this, um, but the bottom line is um, that research uh, it's important that research accurately represents what's out there. Um, if we want to use research to open hearts and change minds, um, to lend credibility about recovery housing, what it is and what it can do, and to advocate for recovery housing, we have to have an accurate picture, accurate picture of what's out there and what's really happening. Everybody's story counts and matters. Um, so this is important for all research, um, but particularly important for the NSTAR projects, um, which aim to address questions about um, access and availability to recovery housing, but also the possibility and promise about re what recovery housing can do for folks in recovery and the communities in which recovery residences are located. Um, so how can you help? Um, well, um, some of you may have already helped us by completing a survey, and if you have, thank you. Um, but if you haven't, don't worry, there's still stuff you can do. Um, you can help by sharing information about NSTAR with folks in your community or decision makers in your state. Um, the more people have heard the term NSTAR, the better. Um, you can also complete a survey about your residence if your residence's name is drawn out of the hat um, and someone from our study contacts you. Um, again, we're sampling residences state by state and we're only halfway through, so um, if you haven't gotten a call, maybe you will. Um, but um, even if you're not called, if your house isn't um, drawn out of the hat, um, you can still volunteer to complete a survey. Um, and volunteering is super easy. Um, you can go to the NSTAR website and tell us about your house um, and let us know where to serve, uh, send the survey link. Um, or you can email my, um, my colleague, Colleen Barrett, um, with information how, and uh, your house and where she can send you a survey link. I also have some flyers um, if you want to pick one up after the session um, so that you can um, find out about the survey that way. So this is the NSTAR team. Um, it's uh, a bunch of people. Um, some faces up there may look familiar. Um, Dave Sheridan is part of the NSTAR project and is in the audience. Um, but let me give some, uh, some other shout outs too. So Adrian Faxio is the project coordinator of the NSTAR projects. Um, so she's in the upper right um, and the, the, the top row. Um, in the second row, there's Jayla Barrett, or uh, sorry, um, Jayla Burton, um, who is um, coordinating all the activities for the COVID supplement study. Um, and next to Jayla is Colleen Barrett. Um, and she's the person you would want to contact if you want to volunteer um, to be a um, part of the, the NSTAR study. Um, in addition to my study, um, who, and they're the wind beneath my, uh, the, my colleagues on the study, the wind beneath my wings, um, I also want to um, acknowledge um, support from NIAAA for the project. Um, we've been doing a lot of work. There's a lot of um, presentations and publications on the NSTAR project. Um, I'm sure that's very, very hard to read. Um, but um, if you want more information, you can go to the website or you can email me. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot to put my email address on my slides. 
Um, but it's not a secret. Um, come up to me afterwards. I'm happy to give it out. Um, but you can also find out more about the NSTAR project um, by going to our website. Um, we also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And with that, I want to make sure that we have time for Paul Stevens. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jenna. All right, thanks so much. I love when you said research opens hearts and changes minds. We're going to, I'm honored to introduce Paul Stevens. Paul Stevens is the regional manager for Oxford Houses of Virginia and the District of Columbia and surrounding Maryland counties. He has 21 years in recovery, which began with his two and a half year membership at Oxford House, Polar Park in Richmond, Virginia. Yes. He began working for Oxford House, Inc. in 2004. Since that time, he has guided Virginia's community of Oxford Houses in forming one of the first state associations, creating an annual state convention with attendance of over 350 and expanding, and expanding from 55 to 160 houses and over 1,300 bids. At the 2000 World Convention, he was the recipient of the Oxford House Annual Founders Awards. He earned his BA in government at Georgetown University and his MS in sociology at Virginia Community Wealth University. He is a national certified recovery support specialist. Welcome, Paul. I might have misheard you, but I thought you said at the 2000 World Convention. I just want to clarify, at the 2000 World Convention, I was in jail. Uh, <laughs> so it was the 2013 World Convention. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we are a little short on time, so I'm just going to apologize in advance if we don't end up with a whole lot of time for Q&A, but I'm sure that all of the speakers would be happy to hang out afterward on the sign and address some of your questions. Okay. So... Uh, I'm going to move fast, dial in. Um, so uh, as you've heard and you heard in the description, Oxford House has long been at the forefront of research and data collection participation. Um, I'm just going to move fast through that, but I will just say that I am definitely one of the people that prescribes to the idea that anonymity has in some regards not served us as a community well, and it has uh, kept us from being researched, it has kept us from advocating for ourselves, and I'm thrilled that that has been changing in the last few years, um, and I'm sure that's going to lead to a lot more public awareness and a lot more funding, which helps. All right, what I really want to do, though, is briefly just talk about the two big DePaul University studies that happened uh, in the, in the mid-2000s, um, and a little bit about the effect that those had uh, for Oxford House, and then I want to touch on some of the data collection that we do right here in Oxford House ourselves. So, the first study was funded by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, um, which is a branch of the National Institutes of Health, and it uh, took about 900 people from around the country in various Oxford houses, it was a national sample, and followed them for a year, and interviewed them at the baseline, interviewed them at four months, eight months, and 12 months, to ask them a bunch of questions. It was a long survey, so I'm not going to touch on most of that data, um, but I will touch on the, uh, a few of the outcomes. Uh, and the primary of those was that after a year, now mind you, if those people didn't stay in Oxford House, we st they still tracked them. So maybe they only stayed for two months, but they tracked them at the four month, eight month, 12 months. So these aren't just the people that stayed in Oxford House the entire year. At the end of that year, uh, out of that group, 86.5% were still clean and sober, which is really quite remarkable. Um, you can see that compared to NIDA's uh, estimate of typical you know, SUD uh, recurrence of use rates of 40 to 60%, we're doing much better with 13.5. This is important. That data really did show that the, the high end of the people that tended to stay uh, abstinent for the duration were people that stayed in Oxford House for six months or longer, which is why we really try to encourage uh, people to stay in Oxford House for six months or longer. Um, and uh, employment, you know, significant income increases, 80% were employed. We know that. After two weeks, we kick them out, make them go look for a job, right? Um, what else? Uh, there was much lower uh, incarceration rates. And again, even with criminal and aggressive behavior, if they stayed in Oxford House for six months or longer, it was associated with lower levels of criminal and aggressive behavior. And this is a, a, a great one, too. 
they studied psychiatric severity in that uh, study, and they found that people with even relatively severe uh, uh, dual diagnoses had equal abstinence rates as people who just came in with substance use disorder. So like Paul Malloy uh, used to like to say, we do well for drunks, druggies, and crazies. Um, so the second big study DePaul University did was funded by NIAAA, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Uh, this one was really interesting because it actually uh, was a randomized study, which you really don't get an opportunity to do very often out in the real world. You can't exactly just turn to someone and go, okay, you be the college graduate and you be the not college graduate, or you be the religious person and you not be the religious person. But we had an opportunity in the Chicago area to get about 150 people to agree to participate. They were all coming out of a couple different treatment centers and agree to either be assigned to Oxford House or not. Um, and so half of those people were assigned to go live in Oxford Houses. Uh, all of them were accepted. Um, a high percentage completed it. And this was a two-year study, so uh, longer. And they interviewed everybody at six-month intervals. Um, and the fact that it's randomized also is much more attractive as far as the research community and the academic community. That's the, the results of that kind of a study are a little more reliable or sound or impressive. So the outcomes, uh, Oxford House, the people that were assigned randomly versus those that were just sent to typical or usual care conditions had an abstinence rate of 69 versus 35%, twice as high, um, over twice as high of a monthly income and three times less of an incarceration rate. So really, really great outcomes. In addition, they did a little cost-benefit analysis and uh, estimated that for every person that moves into an Oxford house, we're saving approximately $23,000 in uh, not incarcerating those people. Um, and when you add all the costs that the house is paying as far as rent and utilities and all that, it goes up to over $31,000 uh, benefit per person. And again, this study with uh, following people for two years also very much confirmed the fact that that magic sort of duration of stay is six months because you know the 35% were the people that were not assigned to Oxford House and the difference between those that stayed less and greater than six months is obviously pretty striking with 54% abstinence versus 84% abstinence. So stay in Oxford House for longer than six months. So, um, Oxford House, I really can't overstate sort of the benefit that Oxford House has had from having agreed to participate in these studies. Um, we were named the only recovery residence model named to uh, SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices and Programs. We were featured in the historic report by the Surgeon General in 2016 for our success. That was a big deal too. Um, and literally, that research put us on the map, it really did. We owe an incredible debt of gratitude to Dr. Lenny Jason and all the people that participated in that research or ran that research at DePaul University. If you live in an Oxford house in any of those states, I can almost guarantee that you would never have had an opportunity to live in an Oxford house if it were not for that research. I go to a, a conference every year called NASADAD the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors, Anna, also joins us there a lot. And we try to pitch Oxford House to states where we don't have contracts. And the, the research and the data is typically what sells them. Uh, and the low cost. They like that too. Um, so we really do have a lot to thank for the research. And really, the debt of gratitude, and I want to point this out, it's important, is to the people that agreed to participate in that research, right? If it had not been for that 900 and that 150 people that agreed to be participants in the research and follow it all the way through to the end of the year or the two years, we wouldn't have those numbers and we wouldn't have Oxford Houses in all those states. Okay, quickly I will move to just a little bit of the data collection that we do inside Oxford House. This might be a familiar looking thing to some of you. If you're in a state where the house activity report data is collected uh, via a Google form, uh, via email, which is a lot of them and, uh, and increasing, then this uh, might look familiar. I mean, the house activity report data, if you're not familiar, is just a short list of simple questions we ask every house at the end of the month. How many applications did you receive? How many admissions did you have? How many voluntary departures, departures for relapse, and departures for disruptive behavior? And how many people were living in the house at the end of the month? There's actually a couple other questions that we ask in some states, and I'm hoping we'll start doing that in more states. In between applications received, 
and admissions, we ask how many interviews did you conduct and how many of those interviews did you accept, which I'll show you can give us some additional information that's pretty interesting. Um, and the state, you know, the state agencies that we contract with that give us the money to have outreach workers and put on events, uh, they, they ask for this data. It's important to them. They like data. You know, you've heard these other speakers talk about that. They like to see the data. Um, and they like to know what they're getting for their money, right? I mean, we do, we do take, you know, tax dollars in the form of this, you know, federal grant pass-through and some other funding sources, and so they want to know what they're getting. Um, caveat to this data, oh, here, I'll take pictures. Um, this is very, very fast and dirty, all right? I did not really uh, get into the weeds on analyzing the validity of some of this data. I just grabbed some random uh, states and did some quick calculations. I'm just doing this as an example, all right? So don't go home and say, oh my God, we have the highest abstinence rate of any state in the country because I'm not entirely, you know, I can't, just don't quote me on the data. But it's interesting that we can pull some stuff like abstinence rates just out of the House Activity Report data. And you can see the dark blue line is the first six months of the fiscal year 2022. So that was July of 2021 to June of this year is the 12 months that I tracked here. Um, and there's some differences. And I mean, the data won't tell me why there's differences. I have some ideas about that. Um, I also think one of the caveats is the uh, COVID. And we know that uh, this has been a really, really rough time for addicts and a really rough time for people early in recovery. And so it wouldn't surprise me if our abstinence rates were a little lower today than they were, say, when the research was done uh, 15 years ago. But there is useful information that we can pull. Um, here's another example, which is just occupancy rates. I like this because uh, it sort of debunks the theory I hear a lot, which is, oh, don't worry, our houses are all going to fill up in the winter because, you know, everybody want, is cold. <laughs> they want to get clean and live in a house. This would suggest that's not necessarily true because otherwise there would be a big curve over the, the winter months, and there isn't. Um, in fact, with at least a couple of those states, Virginia and uh, Oklahoma, you're just seeing a a progression of increasing uh, occupancy rates, which is good. Again, that explanation might be COVID because you know, for a while in the middle of COVID, we really had a lot of trouble filling beds and we've been kind of making a comeback since then, which is good. Um, so here's an example of some of the additional data that you can collect with the, or can, you know, additional information you can learn from the House Act to report data. If you ask those questions about acceptances, uh, uh, occupancy rates, and this is just a breakdown of a few chapters in Virginia. And I mean, it's good for the outreach workers to keep an eye on. I, I highlighted a couple things. The green is a great, wonderful high occupancy rate. The red are some things that, if it, you know, this is one month, so I mean, it really isn't that telling. But if it, you know, went on for several months, then uh, we'd be worried about, you know, low act acceptance rates or low matriculation rates. Matriculation meaning people that were accepted, do they actually end up moving in? Um, all right running out of time. So the second important data collection that we do internally is the annual Oxford House member survey. Uh, so when it's time for your state to do that, please uh, participate. Please have all your House members participate. We really shoot for as close to 100% uh, you know, participation in that as we can get. And we can do these great state profiles. We get a lot of information out of that about demographics, you know, race, uh, gender, education, uh, and some things like, uh, well, here's, this is preliminary too. There's a lot of states that have not finished the 2022 annual survey, so this is not necessarily uh, the end of that. Um, in fact, I know Texas, which has uh, gonna have a higher percentage of Hispanic uh, members is not in here, uh, but that's just a quick look at at least a snapshot of some of our houses in 2022 and the racial breakup. There is a snapshot of some of those states as far as primary substance of use. Very disappointed to see so much alcohol. Bad drug of choice. <laughs> really? And I come from Virginia, and they have the highest rate of alcohol. <laughs> anyway, um, and this is a quick breakdown. It's interesting. I mean, there is some variation, right, between like states that have really high levels of opioid use. I conflated heroin and prescription drugs for the purposes of this. Um, but again, just some examples of the stuff that we can pull from this, which is why we really do count on you guys uh, participating in that data collection. Uh, and this is just some 
uh, look at the average age in a couple different states, you know, which varies too. It would be more interesting if I had pulled some data over time because we've been watching the average age in Oxford House actually go down over the last few years, which is great. What that means is people are getting into recovery and getting into Oxford Houses at earlier ages and at earlier stages in their addiction, which is, is good news. So, uh, oops, uh, just in summary, uh, you know, for a long time, housing was definitely an overlooked part of the continuum of care. It's not so much anymore. People are paying attention to it. People are funding research on it. That's great. We're very happy about that. Um, but as the other speakers indicated, there's a lot that we still don't understand and a lot more research that's needed. Um, and Oxford House prides itself in participating in that. And we hope that if you're ever given the opportunity to do so, that you will definitely participate that, encourage your house, your chapters to also participate in that research. It matters. Uh, and that's all I got. I mean, maybe time for one or two questions if somebody wanted to run up to the mic real quick. Yeah. And then uh, we'll just uh, maybe stand over on the side and field some other questions. Hi, Paul. You know me. <laughs> um, for the monthly form that gets filled out, Mm -hmm. What house position fills that out, or can anyone in the house fill it out? I think it's going to vary state to state. I mean, I can only answer. Our state. Secretary. Okay, well, what if in the house they have somebody else checking the email? Let's talk about it afterward. Okay. All right. I, on one of the slides that said there was, um, for recovery housing, there's still suspicion on the federal level. Can you maybe explain maybe what that is and what can be done about microphone. it? So there's just, there hasn't been as much interest in recovery, recovery support services and recovery housing at the federal level um, until relatively recently. So the, like I said, um, so the Oxford House has been on the map since 1988 at the federal level, um, and, but in, in this only been in the past couple years um, outside of some work um, that SAMHSA has promoted um, that recovery housing has really um, gained some important traction. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you.